Hello and welcome to AXA Arctic Live. I seem to have found myself all the way down inside a glacier in the Arctic. Today's lesson is all about keeping warm and we'll be doing a little bit about how you can investigate the insulating properties of different materials and how you can do that at home. So welcome to Virtual Neolosund. Neolosund is the science settlement that we go to with Arctic Live. And my name is Jamie, and I will be hosting this lesson for you today. So on Arctic Live, if we weren't on lockdown, we would be up in the Arctic and we would be doing a couple of things. We would be looking at some science and we're doing a marine monitoring program. So that means that we look at the health of the ocean up here and we look at two things in particular. We're looking at uh, ocean acidification and that's the process by which carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is absorbed into the ocean and changes its pH, its acidity, so its chemistry is changing and how that might affect uh, the life that we find in the sea. And the second bit of science that we do is looking at plastics and whether we find plastics up here. But where is here? Well, luckily, I've got a little globe to show you where we are, and this, then I'll just let you know a little bit about the science settlement. So if we can see, I'm just going to take my glasses down so I can see on screen a little bit more, um, bring that in. And you can probably see up here, Oh, where are we? Up here, we have the island of Svalbard. So that's halfway between the top of Norway and the North Pole. We've got Greenland here, Iceland, the UK, Spain, France, those other countries. So we would be up on Svalbard in a science settlement of Neolosund. Now, Neolosund is uh, the no most northerly uh, community in the world. It used to be a mining settlement and over the past 50 years or so we've seen a change where it's becoming a science community so the science research stations and that's where visiting scientists go up and stay while they go and explore the ocean or the glaciers and do research up there. But there's also a huge amount of support it gives. There's a power station, there's a marine lab, there's a central sort of canteen area there's an airstrip, all those types of things that provide the support for the science to take place. It's a really special place to go and incredibly beautiful as well. Now, in this session, we'll be looking at keeping warm, and keeping warm when you're in the Arctic is incredibly important. And the format of this lesson will take you through the investigations, a couple of investigations to talk you through. And then we'll come on to the pre-submitted questions, and then we'll come to the live chat. Now, the live chat over here, it is on YouTube. So that means that if you are under 13, you should have a parent or guardian. They should be logging on for you and assisting you with that, typing in for you, because you shouldn't be using social media under the age of 13. Do please also remember that it's a live classroom, not a live chat room. So we really welcome uh, questions, comments, shout outs, where you're dialing in from. I've got a hi from Dave in Durham um, coming in here. I've got uh, uh, Raymond who's watching from Princeton and New Jersey um, and, and Hattie from Hepworth as well. Um, so do keep on coming with those shout outs and questions during the call. A few shout outs that have been submitted in advance. We've got Oscar from Anglesey. Great to see you, Oscar. A fab scientist and explorer in the making. We have a big hello to all St. Wilfred's Catholic primary school students in Cheshire. Um, hi to all of you guys. And your teachers are missing you all, but hope to see you back in school soon. And we've also got the fab students from Union Point Academy, and they are over in Kentucky in the USA. Uh, so we're going to look at these two things. We're going to look at sort of um, how, first of all, people can stay warm using a variety of different materials. And then second, how animals can stay warm. 
So first of all, we're just going to go over a couple of key points with you. We're going to look at some key science vocabulary. And the first science vocab I want to do with you is about materials that are thermal conductors and materials that are thermal um, insulators. Now, these are the properties of the materials. So on your screen, you can see two pictures of spoons, one a metal spoon and one a wooden spoon. Now, we say that the metal spoon is a good thermal conductor because it will take on the temperature of the water or air around it more readily. So if it is um, in a fridge, a metal spoon will lose any of its thermal energy more quickly to the atmosphere. And if it is, you put it in boiling water, it will become hotter faster. So there's this faster um, passing of this thermal energy. With a conductor material, I'm going to talk about materials, we've got plastics, metal, wool, um, wood, glass, these what we call materials. But if you've got a con thermal conductor like wood, it's a very slow change in the temperature. So if we put it where it is in a hotter place, we put it in a hot saucepan where we're stirring our food, we'll feel that the end of that wooden spoon is still okay to touch, whereas a wooden spoon, I mean a metal spoon, might have got hotter. Likewise, if we put a warm spoon into the freezer, we find that the rate of change is slower. So we find that it cools down um, slower. And with all of this, we need to find some way of measuring that change. And with heat, the way that we measure that change mm -hmm. is using temperature. And a thermometer is the tool that we use to measure that change. Now, there are two scales, or there's actually more, more than two scales, but two scales that are in common use for uh, measuring temperature. We have Fahrenheit, that's more common in the USA, and we have Celsius, that's more common in Europe. With a Fahrenheit scale, we have the, I mean, we have the freezing point of water at uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, and then the boiling point of water at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So we we'll, we'll talk about freezing is when water goes from a liquid to a solid, and then for, for boiling from a liquid to a gas. On the Celsius scale, we have 100 units between freezing and boiling, so freezing at zero degrees and boiling at 100 degrees. Interestingly, uh, there is one temperature where the temperature is actually the same with the same number using either Fahrenheit or Celsius. I have been at this temperature a few times, but it'd be great if on the live chat you could try and guess the temperature at which Celsius and Fahrenheit are actually the same. It's a really cool temperature and we can tell you all about it in a bit. But when we come to the Arctic, one of the things we have to make sure is that we stay safe. And one of the great ways of staying safe is keeping warm. So you can see here, I've got this incredibly hot, hot hat um, and it's so nice and warm down here at the bottom of this glacier. So you can see behind me, this bright light is the sunlight coming down this vertical shaft into the glacier. This is called a moulin, um, a French name uh, for a mill, but it's reflecting a sort of vertical sort of well shaft and this is where the melt water from the glacier in the summer carves this wonderful, wonderful shape. Now, I'm about 40 meters below the surface now, so there isn't any wind. So I'll just take off my super warm hat and, and put it to the side here. But a good hat is really, really important for staying warm in the Arctic. Now, for our first investigation, we are going to make 
a series of virtual sort of bodies. We're not going to do this experiment live with you the whole way through. It's really great to do this in a kitchen. It can get a little bit messy and there's certainly some water might get splashed around. So I don't want your computers, wherever you may be, getting harmed by spilled water. So I'm just going to demonstrate it now and then do have a go afterwards and think about what the best material would be for exploring the Arctic. Now, here we have our virtual body. So you'll need for this a series of containers. Now, I'm using a jar here and I've filled it halfway up with water. And there's a couple of reasons for this. This is quite cool now. I've let it cool down just so I don't burn my fingers. Make sure the water you use is from the hot tap, not from the kettle. And this will reduce the likelihood of getting any burns and if there are any spills or drops or anything. Second, make sure you don't fill it right to the top. This gives you a little section up here where you can hold it again without your fingers getting too, too hot. So you've got a warm water in here. The second thing you need to have ready is, of course, your thermometer to measure the temperature. And then the third thing is just gathering a set of different materials from around the house to try and keep it warm and get a sense of what is the best material to make clothing out of to insulate you in the Arctic. What we don't want is all our body heat being conducted away. We want it insulated and that is what we're going to look at. So I could have some woolen long johns. There we go, rod nice fetching. Um, I could also um, have a very holy and old um, synthetic sort of polyester top there, one of my base layers, or I could have a rather fetching um, T-shirt with all the Svalbard wildlife on. I think I'll go for the T-shirt. So you'll need the same number of your sort of virtual bodies using the same amount of water as you are, as you have different types of materials. I think three is probably quite a good number. Before you start wrapping your body in a material, you need to take the temperature first. So if you're looking at change, you need a before and after. So you switch on your thermometer, you dip it in and make sure you record it. Um, obviously, um, this being a medical thermometer, it's decided that I have um, no longer alive. It's so cold. Uh, so um, according to this thermometer, I am not alive anymore, which is, which is a pity um, because I am. Uh, but, so we're going to carry on. So you take the temperature, then we get our material, wrap it round, make it sure all completely round. There we go. And then we use an incredibly important Arctic tool. We use some duct tape or gaffer tape to wrap around that. So I'm just going to get a length of this tape. <laughs> Oof. I've got a guess here of 500 degrees on where Celsius and Fahrenheit meet. And I'm going to tell you, that's not the number I was looking for. So making sure it's all completely covered, wrapping it up all the way around, and there we go. And then what you'll need to do is do that with all the materials that you're testing. Put those in the fridge until the end of the lesson or about 20 minutes if you're doing it afterwards and then use your thermometer to test again and record the change. Now what you're looking for is the lowest change. 
Which material has kept that jar or glass of water warmest for longest? Be because that's the kind of material we'd love to use to go to the Arctic with. So will you wrap yourself in a T-shirt to go to the Arctic, a thermal top, um, some woolen long johns, or will it be something else? Now, we, when we go to the Arctic, humans aren't terribly well adapted to the cold. So we use equipment, we use materials, we use clothing to keep ourselves warm. Animals, however, have a number of adaptations they use to keep warm in the Arctic. You might notice one if you look at photographs of a walrus or a polar bear, that they're covered in a layer of what's called blubber, a thick layer of fat. Now, I've always wondered, does that thick layer of fat really keep you that warm? And it's a great way of finding out. And we have an activity online called Blubber Gloves. Now, with Blubber Gloves, you're testing to see whether fat keeps a hand warmer if it's covered rather than if it's just bare. So for this, what you would need is a bucket of water with some ice in it. Put both hands in, but one hand is going to be special. Now, there's a clean way and a messy way of doing this. The clean way is to make a glove, and you can get just two plastic bags, fill the in-between with margarine or butter or something, a fat, and then tape the top round so none of that escapes, and use that glove and compare it to see whether that keeps your hand warmer than just a bare hand. The messy way is pretty fun, though. It's just covering one hand completely with butter or margarine and putting those both in water and seeing if you can feel the difference. So these are just two live investigations that you can use to investigate this idea of insulation. One of them for people and the different materials that we can use in the Arctic, and one of them looking at the adaptations of animals that we might find up here. So would love to hear how you get on. Any photographs either of blubber gloves or looking at some of the materials you're choosing, a parent or guardian can post those on Twitter using the hashtag Arctic Live or using the Twitter handle at EncounterEDU. And it's great to see how you get on at home. So what we're going to look at now is just some of those questions that you've been sending through in advance and also those questions that you're sending through on the live chat. Don't be afraid to repost your question because it's sometimes hard to see those that are posted towards the beginning of a live lesson. And it's great to have them coming again so we can see them afresh. So coming to our pre-submitted questions, it's a really, really lovely one. And we've got from St. Wilfred's Catholic Primary School, looking at the difference in wool between the fabrics used for clothing now and those used historically by explorers. And it's really interesting because they've asked, if furs are not as warm because we don't use them anymore, how, how do animals survive the cold and keep warm? Super interesting. I think one of the, there's a few things to talk about. The natural fibers are still really, really great. Um, so we use wool a lot. Um, as one of the insulating layers in the Arctic. I normally don't have a fleece underneath a jacket like this. I'll have a nice, warm, traditional Norwegian jersey or a fisherman's jersey from the UK, like a Guernsey. And they keep me really nice and warm. Likewise, a number of people still have items of fur, which is really, really great for keeping and trapping a layer of warm air towards the body. So these traditional fabrics have inspired what we um, use as modern explorers. 
But the reason why we've invented all these new types of clothing is threefold. First of all, the hunting of animals um, on a commercial basis to supply a wide and large market is now seen as a, a bad thing, especially the farming that's done for the commercial fur market. Indigenous communities might hunt in a responsible and local way that isn't affected by some of these concerns. Second, fur works really, really well in a dry Arctic. It doesn't work so well in a wet Arctic. So some of the synthetic fabrics and materials that we use work much better if it gets a bit damp. Now, there's two reasons for it getting damp, one of which is, is the Arctic get, is getting damper with more rain coming both early in the season, sometimes in March, and also later in the season through the late spring and summer like we have now. Another reason for getting damp is that you might sweat a lot and that sweat will go into the materials. Now, if that's in a modern material, it won't lose its insulation as much, but if you're using something like down, um, the, the sort of like soft feathers um, from birds like the eider duck, then that might lose all the insulation. So modern fabrics tend to compensate for that and work well, even if a bit wet. Wool still works really well if it's wet as well. But the last thing, and this is where we really sort of like have come to think about performance of materials, is the amount of warmth you get for the weight of the material. Now, certainly I could come here with a big woolly pulley or with a big old tweed jacket with all these traditional bits of kit and clothing, but they would weigh a lot more than the clothes, the modern clothes I have. So I have a bit of a mix. We're really lucky, in fact, that we can fly everything up to our base and we can operate from there. But for those people who are trying to keep their kit as light as possible, that we're finding that a lot of the modern fabrics are able to give you a much better weight to warmth ratio. So you're staying warmer with a lighter bit of kit. So it's not necessarily that um, old clothes aren't as good. And certainly we take a lot of ideas from traditional clothing and in fact from the wildlife up here. It's just that for several reasons, for weight, for being warm when it's damp, for all these different reasons, people have moved on to different materials. Really great question there. Um, we've got a, a guess here on the temperature from Inez. Is it minus 36 degrees Celsius slash Fahrenheit? Um, that's a really good guess. In fact, it's minus 40. Minus 40 is where Celsius and Fahrenheit meet. Um, so really good to get those questions coming through. We've got a question here from Dan, a couple of questions. First of all, what is blubber? It's a layer, a thick layer of fat um, around uh, the body of a variety of polar animals from uh, walrus to whales to polar bears. But the second question, Dan, is, is, is what the temperature is at the moment in Neolicent. Uh, Dan, great, great question. Uh, the temperature today is really quite warm. It's about minus one, minus two degrees Celsius. It's been quite a warm week this week um, in the Olsen with temperatures between about zero and minus five, minus six. Next week's looking a bit colder. In terms of the, the, the temperatures I've experienced whilst working in Swalbot over the past sort of five, six years, um, I have been, uh, the warmest has been plus two degrees uh, Celsius. The coldest, uh, including wind chill, I think we had minus uh, 58 and a half degrees Celsius. That was a very chilly day. So it varies quite a lot. Um, that was just in, in, in a matter of a week um, of having that range of temperatures from two degrees to minus 58. So a 60 degree uh, temperature range uh, in just a week. It is getting warmer. So winter's down to about minus 25, minus 30. Summer's up to sort of five, six degrees Celsius. So that's kind of temperature range. And I think um, our wonderful producer, Ellie, uh, might be able to show us what the weather is at the moment 
um, in the Olsen. There's a webcam. If you just go up the Moulin, down the glacier, the Brogabrine, and then up to the Zeppelin um, station, they've got a great webcam. And I think we can show you what the weather is like right now in the Olsen. We certainly can. This here is the live weather window. It was updated, as you can see, 11 minutes ago. And this is showing the town, the settlement of Neolisund. If I press play, we'll be able to see the last 24 hours of very clear skies. Obviously, very cold with snow on the ground. And you can sort of see a little bit of surface ice, but not solid ice on the fjord there. And I'll let it run again, and you'll also see that the sun doesn't set in that 24 hours. It just moves across the sky, because, of course, we're into the Arctic summer, which is 24 hours daylight. Back to you, Jamie. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Ellie. Um, I've got a question, um, again, from St. Wilfrid's Catholic Primary School. Uh, and they're saying that they do forest school, and their toes so and fingers sometimes get cold. Any advice for how to keep them warm? without spending lots of money on equipment? It's, it's a great question. And I've just got um, a few bits of things. Um, first of all, um, you probably, these are the kind of boots we wear up in the Arctic, so you're not spending lots of money on equipment. But the main thing is thinking about, uh, if you are gonna spend money on footwear, I think the best thing to spend money on are, are socks. Uh, the material's really important here. And there's something called a loop stitch sock. And that's where you find the inside of still sort of nice and soft and fuzzy. And it's made up of, of lots of little loops of a material. Make sure it's not cotton so it doesn't get cold when it's wet. Um, but those are fab to keep you, your toes nice and toasty. Um, so that's a good one to look at. And also when they're nice and fresh and the loops are bigger, we, you find that, that that sort of cushiony niceness um, make keeps your feet really nice and warm and that's definitely something I invest in more often is new socks that haven't got flattened down um, and aren't as warm the other thing if you're looking at gloves is not necessarily to um, get super duper gloves I've um, got a range of gloves down here and I'll just share some ideas with you So I've got a range of different gloves that I'll wear and they go all the way from the thinnest so I can use equipment, um, a sort of medium glove, which I can wear on top of that, a, a big thick glove, sometimes instead of the medium one, and then a big mitt over the top. So layering is a really important concept to use in terms of clothing. So if you do have a um, cold hand and you've got a pair of gloves already, getting a thin layer glove underneath um, and you can get them uh, quite cheaply is a really good idea. So I've got one glove here. Oh, wrong hand. Here we go. I can just put that on top there. Now, that's using equipment. So there's one that's just changing the kind of kit we buy um, and it doesn't have to be too expensive. But the other thing you do is what you see a lot of people doing in the polar regions um, is movement. So if your feet get cold, remember lots of stamping around and moving just to get the blood down into your tootsies um, and keep them going. And then if your fingers get cold, a really, really important thing to do is windmilling. So big loops with your arms and windmilling around and that gets the blood back into the end of your fingers and warms you up really, really well. It's super important we get cold when we're still. And our kit that we use doesn't make us hotter, it just keeps us hotter. So by moving, we generate that heat and then our equipment, our kit can keep that heat with us. So if you are cold, don't forget, movement is one of the key things to getting warm again. So, and then lots of lots of uh, we just have lots of tea and chocolate as well, which we find helps a lot. Um, but maybe that's not so suitable uh, for forest school. Um, but really lovely question. Um, <laughs> ben would like to know: Is it a good idea to grow long hair and a beard for the Arctic? 
Uh, I certainly, I, I like having a beard. It's just when there's a bit of wind, um, it just, just keeps you um, a bit a bit better insulated. There was one drawback, um, though. So if you get below about minus 30 and you have a beard and you have um, a face guard like this and you're breathing into your face guard, so all the moisture from your breath can come into the fabric here. And because it's so cold, that moisture will start to freeze instantly. And you'll find that if you come back into your tent or come back into base, then this fabric is actually frozen to your face. And then you have to get as a mug of tea or something or gently sort of try and melt it off. Um, because if you don't melt it and you try and take it off, you'll find you end up taking half your uh, beard and face um, with you. Um, so yes, the, there is upsides and downsides um, to having a beard in the Arctic. In terms of long hair, uh, this is a, a lockdown look um, rather than an Arctic look. Um, I'm going to pass over to Ellie because I don't know um, from a female perspective um, to long hair, short hair, that kind of thing, whether you, you kind of notice any, any difference um, or have any advice um, from that front. It's okay, um, and it's great to get these sort of different different perspectives. Um, ben, it's a it's a great great question. I'm just going to take um, one more question, um, which is what is the best food to keep you warm? And then Ellie will be able to give you um, a different perspective on on hair and keeping warm in the Arctic. The best food to keep you warm, Evie. Um, what's really important to remember is this whole thing about calories. Now, calories is not a unit that describes um, making you uh, fat or anything else. Calories is simply a unit of energy. And it's the energy in a food that keeps you warm. So high calorie food is what you want in the Arctic. And so we'll find, sometimes we'll find packing, we'll find a diet sachet of something and we'll throw it out because the weight to warmth ratio is simply not worth carrying. So we'll take a lot of things um, like uh, oof, uh, chocolate, dried fruit, nuts. We'll have a lot of butter and fatty foods in our diet. And all that helps keep us warm. Great question, Evie. And I'm just seeing if we're ready to, to, to pass over. Ellie, could you give us a perspective on sort of hair, having long hair, does that help keep you warm in the Arctic? Um, it can do. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so I found um, that my hair, as you can see, is quite long. Um, and so I'm able, funnily enough, to kind of make a little scarf out of my own hair and tuck it all around like this and then I have um, this is a bamboo balaclava so it's made of 50% bamboo and 50% cotton now bamboo has got a really good thermal con um, insulating property so we learned earlier from Jamie about conductor and insulator bamboo keeps you um, warm when you're warm and cold when you're cold so I put my hair scarf inside my bamboo and then I can do this and I can be all snug as a bug. Um, but what I do find as well is that sometimes the if you have bits of hair sticking out, you have to tie it all up because if you have bits sticking out, then they can freeze and um, get a bit uh, icy and stuck. Same thing with your eyelashes. So that's why I have my goggles to, uh, to keep my eyes warm. <laughs> Brilliant. Ellie, thank you so much uh, for that insight. Um, and I can only, only report from, from, from my own experience. Um, we've got a great question through um, from Innes, um, who was asking um, a little bit about um, the special materials for keeping warm. I think we covered that, but also about food and, and how we um, refrigerate food. Uh, it's, it's an interesting question. It depends on different trips. So on, on some trips that I've been on where we've had very low temperatures for a long time, which are colder uh, than a freezer, which is about minus 18, minus 20, 20 Celsius, 
Uh, so we've had temperatures like that. We can just put our frozen goods in a box in the snow, and that's absolutely fine. On base, when we're in the Olesund, the temperature today is only minus two. That's much, much um, higher, warmer uh, than the domestic freezer. And so they have big uh, freezer units um, in the Arctic, in the station, to keep the food frozen. And that's really, really important um, at the moment. You can uh, lock down affecting lots of different parts of the world, in fact, all the world pretty well. And it's the same for the Arctic. So they have about a year's worth of food stockpiled just in case they can't get a ship in to resupply them. And that is mostly frozen food um, that's going to be, be kept in that stockpile. So having a, a freezer unit, having a refrigerator to keep that super fresh, even if the temperatures are around minus two, zero, two degrees, is really important. Great. Um, Finley would like to know, what's your favorite meal in, in the Antarctic? Um, and what is there? Um, favorite meal in the Antarctic? Finley, I've only done one Antarctic um, expedition, and the food was pretty grim. We borrowed a, an old hut off a Russian research station on King George Island, and we took all our food with us, and it, it was sort of boil-in-the-bag camping food. I do remember the Kung Pao chicken being fought over, uh, but it's all this sort of dehydrated camping food, and we would get water from a lake or from 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 a glacier um, to, to to mix in with that and heat that up and have sort of you know rehydrated rations. Um, in the Arctic, in the Olesund, we have really wonderful food. So we all uh, share a big canteen. All the different nations come together, and they can do a whole range of food. They can cater for diets. So vegetarians are very well catered for. Vegans are very well catered for as a whole range to keep the community up there super happy. Um, because if you're out for a long day doing your science or doing your work, then having a wonderful, wonderful uh, big meal at the end of it, really, really important. Um, Dan says he wished he had long hair. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, just uh, for those watching, we've got James uh, mentioning uh, that negative 40 that's cold, Raymond, who's been at, at minus 27. To give you a sense of what this means um, in, in the polar regions, it's different from if you live in temperate regions where you can quite have quite wet cold. It's very dry cold um, in the Arctic. But minus down to minus 25, minus 27, minus sort of 30, it, it's all okay. You've got your kit on and, and everything's just about fine. For every five degrees below minus 25, we say things get twice as hard. So minus 30, twice as high, hard, minus 35, you know, four times as hard, minus sort of 48 times as hard to work, to operate as minus um, 25. Now, someone once told me that the best way of getting a sense of what it's like being out on the Arctic sea ice Maybe it's minus 40, there's a wind up, the tiny bits of, of, of snow are more like sort of sand being blasted in your face. It's blown snow across the sea ice. Now, here's a way of experiencing that same feeling. You have to promise me that you will not try this at home. You just have to imagine it. Please, please, please don't do this at home. So imagine you're holding a fork sitting where you are, close your eyes, get inside a domestic freezer, which is only about minus 20, make it twice as cold, you're in there. So that's that really aching, biting cold coming in. If you've licked an ice cream and had a headache, it's five times worse than that. And then take the fork and stab any exposed part of your skin. And that stinging sensation along with the ache is what it's like operating at minus 40. Please don't try this. This, this is an imagination exercise, not a hint uh, for what to do. Um, brilliant. Um, ben, um, commenting here, uh, do Arctic fish feel the cold? I'm not sure whether they feel the cold, but a number of species have antifreeze in their blood to stop their blood from freezing, such as the Arctic cod. Uh, can you live in the Arctic even in the winter? 
Well, there are populations who live in the Arctic all year round. What we find in the Olesen, though, is a sort of changing from season to season. You definitely have a smaller crew during the winter, people who overwinter, um, to spend the winter here, a smaller number of people, often to keep the facilities running, to do some long-term science observations, that kind of thing. And then during the spring and summer months, larger numbers of visiting scientists come. So the population of Neolosund can go from maybe sort of just 30-odd up to several hundred people in the height of the summer. So it's quite a big change. When we're up in the Olesund, it's a sort of late spring, early spring, sort of 80 to 100 people um, in, in the community as a whole. Um, Innes would like to know, how do you know in the winter when it's night or not? And in the summer as well, when it's day or not? So when you have these periods of 24 hours of darkness or 24 hours of sunlight, you have to be very disciplined. So you can't just say, oh, well, it's night, I'm going to sleep all the time, or it's day, I'm going to work all the time. You have to behave in a very strict manner. You have to have a routine to keep you going. So you get up um, at the same time as you would ordinarily. You go through your routine and you make sure that everybody else does the same. Because it'd be nothing worse, and this is uh, something that can happen in 24-hour daylight, is that people work into the night. They go to bed at 4 o'clock in the morning, but they wake people up, and nobody gets a good night's sleep. So it's very important to keep that routine. And then we also have, um, in the station, we've got special blackout blinds to cut out the midnight sun. If I'm camping, then I will put on my hat like this, which is my nice little furry um, sort of eye mask and sort of keeps my nose warm as well. So back to front, woolly hat as well, I find great for blocking out the midnight sun. Um, Raymond, um, obviously concerned about cold temperatures. At what temperature will you die in the Arctic? Raymond, it, it's, it's keeping warm is big part of safety. So. If you've got the right kit, um, you should be able to survive at most temperatures. It's when you, two things, if you get lost and, 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 or if there's an accident and you can't get anywhere, that's when you might want to, um, that's when it become dangerous. If you get wet, um, whether through a spill, sweating too much, um, you put your foot through the sea ice, there's a boat accident, anything like that um, is also a big, big issue. So, so wet, almost worse than cold. Um, but people can survive at very low temperatures, down to minus 50s, minus 60s. It is very, very hard. What's important then are skills in order to build shelter um, and to be able to wait, wait, that, wait that out and to be able to continue moving um, and having the right equipment. So it's, it's those practical skills that will keep you alive in the Arctic. <laughs> We've got time, I think, just for one one or two more questions. We've got uh, this question and one more, so keep them coming. Um, is it really bad to eat ice cream if you're really hungry in the cold? Um, love a bit of ice cream in, in, in the frozen, frozen regions, um, but uh, not a bad thing at all, um, as, long as, you're, as long as you're sensible. Um, so don't do it sort of wandering around outside, but a bit of ice cream um, in, the, in the north always goes down well. But thank you all so much. Uh, a great range of questions coming through. It's been really wonderful uh, speaking to you about keeping warm in the Arctic and staying safe. And hopefully we'll see some of you up in the north as explorers or scientists in the future. Do join us for the rest of Arctic Live. We have a sea level rise investigation coming tomorrow and then a whole focus on science over the next week. So really looking forward to that. If you are carrying out the investigations, so the keeping warm investigation, wrapping different containers with water with different materials, or doing the blubber gloves, with the permission of a parent or guardian, we'd love to see pictures or evidence of that. Use the hashtag Arctic Live and the handle at EncounterEDU on Twitter. Be great to see those. So thank you.
once again for being part of Arctic Live. Until the next time, it's bye-bye from me. Bye-bye.